We start this chapter once again with Dolores questioning Vikir on why he thinks that the Nightblood isn't a good guy, her questioning was making everyone on Vikir's side nervous as they started to sweat over her words. Dolores's eyes were set on their target, showing us why it was drawn as a cross eye, she continues to question Vikir's on why he was so sure about his words. Knowing who he was, she continues to ask Vikir to answer her questions, but he remains silent, while Tudor starts to think that he had done something wrong. Seeing and hearing no attempts at a reply, Dolores addresses everyone in the club, claiming that they believed in something without any proof. She reminds them that as reporters, if they say things that aren't proven by facts, then they can destroy an innocent person's life. Tudor cuts in, informing her that the guards of the city had testified that the night hound had destroyed the buildings and killed the headmaster of the orphanage. But Dolores refutes their claim, telling Tudor that the Imperial Guard's interview responses are just testimony consisting of deductions and no solid evidence. She even reminds him that the question regarding the children's corpses that were found in the orphanage's basement has yet to be resolved. And that there were too many questionable variables to determine that the night hound killed those children. The girls on the other hand were stunned by how determined Dolores was in proving them wrong about the night hound, even worried about it. Seeing her so determined to prove the right facts, they couldn't believe that she was staying neutral even though this happened in an orphanage that's managed by her own family. Seeing that no one else was complaining, Dolores turns to Anna, reminding her to edit the article to ensure that it's objective and unbiased. Hearing that order, Anna complains that if they do that, they wouldn't be able to write anything. But Dolores insists on it, saying that it wasn't too late to release a critical report that it was the night hound after what they had found about the incident. Her eyes started to look sad as she thought about what if the night hound really was evil, and reminded the club that if that was true, then they can criticize him harshly. Hearing those words, Vikir couldn't help but take a peek at her through his thick nerd glasses. As the group starts to take in Dolores's words, another member of the club bursts into the room, shouting for the president's attention. The member reports to her that the club advisory was asking for her, stating that the reason was because he wanted her to re-edit the report and state that the night hound was a bad person. Hearing about the request, Dolores started to feel stressed, and replied back to the member that she was going to talk to the club advisor, since he likes making articles into headlines. After settling things in the room, Dolores left with the member to seek out the club advisor and his request. As she left, Tudor was impressed by their president, calling her a girl boss, hearing that, Vikir couldn't help but reply that Dolores had been that way since a long time ago, which confuses Tudor. In Vikir's mind, Dolores looked the same as when she led the Holy Knights on the front lines of the battlefield during the fall before he had regressed. She wore mighty armor and her holiness radiated in a bright light all over. She could be seen on the battlefield, ushering new commands to the Holy Knights, ordering them to push forward as she blesses them with her holy light. She would often complain about the troops, a sign that people these days have weak faith. She even scolds them when she finds them messing around their breaks, telling them to save lives instead. She reminded them that back in her days, if a demon had appeared, then they would just jump in to help. Recalling his past memories of her, Vikir started to smile to himself, he had thought that she would deem his actions as wicked, but to him right now, it doesn't feel bad because someone's trying to tell the truth about him. In his heart, he quietly thanks the saintess for her help, as she argues with the club advisor over his request, who turns out to be Professor Snape. Moving on, in the earlier mornings, a siren started to blare loudly. As it continues to ring, PG awakens from his beauty sleep in a groggy state. The moment he raises his body upright, Vikir greets him with a good morning. Vikir was already up and ready, dressed in his school's exercise clothes and stretching, while PG was still rubbing his eyes, greeting good morning back to our boy. In this academy, everyone has to wake up at 6 a.m. When the alarm sounds, the stupidest head to the training area in front of the dorms. The students then participate in the exercises, following the instructor who stands at the front to wake themselves up. They start off their day with a light jog. After their morning exercises, the students will go their separate ways. Some would catch up on their sleep, some would go and take a bath, and some head straight to the cafeteria. PG could start to feel the strain on his body after the morning exercises, he complains to Vikir that his brain would be more active if he had slept through the morning exercises, but our boy refutes that claim, reminding PG that moving his body helps to activate his brain. But that wasn't what PG wanted to hear, he didn't want to be proven incorrect. Tudor cuts into their conversation, telling Vikir that he wasn't going to be popular with the girls if he didn't act so empathetic. And suggests that he practices it by being empathetic to PG. But hearing that suggestion, PG humbly declines the idea. Tudor then comes up with a new suggestion, 
asking if everyone is free this weekend, as they should have fun by going into the city. PG likes the idea behind it as there was actually a book he needed to buy. Even Sancho chimed into the conversation, saying there was a restaurant that he wanted to try in the city too. Hearing that it was okay with the rest, Tudor turns to ask Vikir. Pausing for a moment, our boy declined the invitation, saying that he needed to volunteer on the weekends. The group was stunned to hear that Vikir needed to do volunteering, PG reveals that our boy had received too many deductions. Hearing about that, Tudor realized that it was probably from Professor Snape, who would pick on Vikir all the time, even if he didn't do anything wrong. Hearing them talk about him, Vikir couldn't help but remain silent. So he moves on from the group, telling them to go to the city without him this time. But the moment he left them, the group started to chase after our boy, changing their plans because all of a sudden, they found volunteering fun. PG calls out to Vikir, telling him that his friends, they couldn't let him do it all alone, Sancho even reminds them that the more, the merrier. But as they followed behind Vikir closely, Tudor started to realize something unusual, drawing Sancho's attention as well as asking what it was. Tudor tells him that when Vikir is around, he naturally gravitates towards him, it was as though Vikir had the aura of an older brother. Hearing that, Sancho adds in, saying that even though Vikir was a quiet boy, he has that sigma riz about him that simply exudes charisma, back when he was a mercenary, Sancho felt that such people were natural leaders. Even PG understood what the boys were saying about our boy, he couldn't help but smile to himself, after all, he found Vikir amazing. Amazing people like Tudor, from the physically great Don Quixote family, and Sancho, the transfer student from the Northern Mercenary Guild approach him first. Vikir was also kind, he had helped PG at the entrance party when he was having a difficult time, and he was perfect in his studies and training. PG felt that as long as he was with Vikir, then he had a feeling that everything he does in life would be possible. But as they walked along the corridors, Vikir's bloodhound bloodthirst leaked out, he looked to the side, eyes red and unleashing his murderous aura. Since he was standing right beside him, PG immediately started to feel afraid when he saw Vikir this way. Ignoring everyone else's presence, Vikir could sense the disgusting aura that the demons gave off, covering the entire walkway they were in. The stench of this horrible aura was coming from a group of a guy and two girls walking away from them. Vikir continues to monitor that group as they slowly walk away from him. Knowing that PG was basically a human dictionary, Vikir asks him if he knew about other students well, and if specially, he knew about the guy that walked past them just moments ago. Jolted by the sudden request, PG asks if Vikir was talking about the guy between the two female students a moment ago, as he knew that guy well. Apparently, he was the most handsome guy in this school, a sophomore called Bane Kodzak. Vikir started to grit his teeth hard, after all, he didn't think that they would be this active within society. A member of the ten elite corpses was right in front of him. As the suspect started to move further away, Vikir started to think about his choices right now, whether he should start the fight, but thinking about it, he decided not to as there would be a lot of casualties. Especially his group, where he couldn't allow the future heroes to get hurt. Sensing that something was off about our boy, the three guys were worried about him, asking Vikir about what was wrong. Our boy simply tells them that he wasn't feeling well, and that he was going to rest. Before engaging in a fight against one of the ten elite corpses, Vikir decides to gather information first. He moves away from the group, using the skill in his second slot called Silent Heel Mashusu. Like Superman removing his glasses to change clothes, our boy did the same, while thinking that he should follow Bane closely behind. But because he was distracted by his thoughts, he doesn't see Dolores coming down the stairs beside him, resulting in a clash between the future titans. A loud scream from Dolores catches the attention of the boys as they gasp in shock over what happened. They could all see that Dolores had fallen to the ground, hurt by something as she waves her hand in pain, while Vikir stood there, stunned by what had just happened. Tudor and the boys rushed over, asking Dolores if she was okay. Tudor immediately tells Vikir to apologize to the president which he did immediately while bowing his head down to her. But Dolores was completely fine with it and didn't need an apology as she also found herself being careless, as she was being helped by Sancho, she couldn't believe how muscular Vikir was, after bumping into him, it felt like she had hit a wall. Looking at our boy as he wears back his glasses, she notices that she couldn't sense his presence at all either, making her wonder who Vikir truly is. Seeing that there were too many people gathered here today, Vikir decides to postpone his plans of following and tailing Bane. Knowing that he was probably the one of the ten elite corpses. Deep down the academy staircases, Bane could be seen leading the two girls into the darkness. Even the girls started to feel that something was off about this place, 
so they questioned him on why he had brought them to such a dark place. Instead of answering their worries, Bane simply tells them that he had some sad news which captures their attention completely as they were worried about him. He starts to tell the girls a story, about how recently, a certain guy had showed up in the school, and since then, he had been messing with him, and because of him, he hasn't been able to eat properly. The girl on his left was quick to defend Bane after hearing the story, telling him that if he was being bullied then she wouldn't forgive the guy in his story. He continues on with his story, knowing about that guy, Bane decided to go see who he was one day, but he was wearing his school uniform by mistake, so he ran away instead. So the guy might have seen that he was one of the academy students. The girl on his right side was even more determined, telling Bane that if the guy comes to the school, then they'll stop him, as the two girls were always on his side. Hearing about how good these girls were to him, Bane thanks them, telling the girls that their hearts were as beautiful as their faces, and that they would always be together. From now on, that is. The moment he said those words, Bane immediately grabbed onto the faces of the two girls with his bare hands at the same time. He started to recall the pandemic mask wearing bastard. Bane knew that he had the skill of a high ranked graduator, so he was sure that our boy didn't die from the explosion like that. He could also see the way Vikir was attacking the places that were connected to the location he had eaten people from before. Which made him realize that Vikir was a human that was able to sense the presence of a demon. As he said this, the two girls' faces started to morph and change all over, they started to beg Bane but he ignored them completely. It turns out that Bane is really the demon that Vikir had been hunting for, his demonic side started to appear as he absorbed the girls' faces into his hands. Taking in all the facts, Bane realized that Vikir might be the one who has something to do with Andromalius's death. As he said this, the girl's eye and mouth appeared on the side of his face, begging for someone to save her. It is revealed that Bane's true name is Dantalion, the ninth corpse of the demon's ten elite corpses. Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.